Welcome to the last episode in our series on Irish food history. This episode is going to examine Ireland in the economic boom years known as the Celtic Tiger and how the economic crash of 2008 affected our foodscape in Ireland. To learn more about what's been happening recently in Irish restaurants, I spoke to Martin McEnumra. So the Celtic Tiger period actually transformed how Irish people consume food both within the home and outside of the home. Because there was suddenly so much more employment, it meant that we had both sexes working. You know, you had mothers and fathers working. One of the phenomena which sort of happened around this period of time would have been sort of the instead of corner shops we had these centres and spars and each of these started to develop these deli counters and in the mornings particularly this particularly Irish phenomenon called the jumbo breakfast roll appeared where a cuisine de France sort of demi baguette which had been sort of semi baked in the oven would have been opened up two bacon, two sausages, egg, you know, an egg, some black and white pudding and loads of tomato ketchup. Ireland in recent years is being recognised internationally as a food destination. Food tourism is something, it's actually a policy that Falcha Ireland has developed from 2002 to the present day. And the most important thing about food tourism is not just that there be one or two good restaurants in the country, but that on average tourists who come here, whether they be local tourists or whether they be foreign tourists, that they would experience a majority of their meals between lunch, bre breakfast, lunch and dinner, that they'd experience really good food in most of those places. And John Mulcahy, who headed up uh, food tourism in Falcha, Ireland uh, many years ago, he made the point that the most important meal of all for any foreign tourist was actually the breakfast they're going to have on the day that they're leaving. And one of the things we do extremely well in this country is our cooked breakfast, our rashers, our sausages, our black pudding, our tradition of you know, kippers and of kedgeri, our beautiful uh, cheeses and fresh meats and that sort of stuff, uh, not to mention our beautiful soda breads, scones and porridges with lovely honey and nuts. So in the 1970s and 1980s, Ireland would not have been known particularly for its good restaurants and as a dining or even a place for food tourism. <laughs> but this all transformed because with the 90s and into the noughties, the effects of uh, returning immigrants with a much more better palate and much more experience of food, people traveling the world, but also of a much more highly educated population. That transformed things. From a culinary perspective, in 1999, the first ever honours degree in culinary arts began in Cahill Brewer Street in Dublin. And for over 20 years, there's been a whole generation of highly trained, educated, and actually well-traveled uh, generation of chefs and of culinarians who have been at the forefront of transforming food in this country. And year on year, from 1999 onwards, the number of Michelin stars and awards has been growing and growing. Now, one of the interesting things is that even during the last recession, when after you know the, the fall of the Lehman Brothers and, 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 and the banks and all of that, instead of restaurants dying as people thought they would, the rents reduced and these young innovative chefs took charge and started to create more reasonably priced foods using lesser cuts, using offal, using lamb shanks instead of leg of lamb, using skirt steak instead of fillet steak, etc, etc. And created you know, energy and creativity within their cooking, which has been dynamic uh, within the world of Irish food. 
nowadays, you know, we have nearly gone full circle as in that what's really exciting nowadays is the idea about local, uh, sustainable, nearly the foods that our great grandparents ate, you know what I mean? All about sort of breeds of animals and grown locally and, you know, artisan and the rest of it. Instead of actually having fancy French words describing your food on a menu, suddenly restaurants such as Chapter One and Ross, with Ross Lewis started to name the suppliers of their foods. They would be putting Fingal Ferguson's chorizo, or they'd be putting, you know, whoever, D David McKiernan's cheese, or they would actually list their suppliers because there was value given to the uh, sourcing of materials and the zeitgeist was to find the best quality materials and then treat them carefully and you would have beautiful food. It's interesting that this tradition has carried through and that even today in the COVID pandemic we all have learned the importance of supporting our local butcher, our local baker, our local farmers and trying to keep the money within the local facility and the local area and, uh, and we're really enjoying the beautiful food that is produced in this country. Ali Malou is now a household name in Ireland. I spoke to Karen Nolan who recently wrote her master's thesis on the woman who founded it. Ireland wasn't known internationally for its food. In fact, many of the international tourist guides and brochures described Irish food as dismal at the best. Um, Irish restaurants adapted generally a French style of cooking, over sauce many times, probably overcooked. Certainly it was the meat to veg, well done, uh, was definitely the whole 60s attitude to Irish food. Not only did Irish restaurants serve their food in a French style, but they they named it, so menus were written in menu French. There was a huge barrier between you know, the, the diner and, 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 the, and the food that they were eating. They didn't know half of it. So there was a very low confidence in what we could produce and what we cooked. How did that change? It was changed by an Irish housewife down in County Cork called Myrtle Allen, who decided, with her children gone or in boarding school, decided what would she do with her big old rambling country house in rural Cork. And as a hobby, she decided to open a restaurant in her dining room. This was unheard of. Nobody, now we would know it as country style, country house. And just a little bit of background on Myrtle Allen. She was a self-styled cook. She taught herself, didn't know how to cook when she, was, when, she, when she first married. She was married to a very progressive horticulturist and mixed farmer, Ivan. She had fabulous produce outside her door. Both herself and her husband were very involved in our National Farmers Union. So they knew their locale, they supported their local producers. And so she raised six children in this house and cooked good basic food, seasonal, local, and simply. So when she decided to open this restaurant, she didn't look to what everybody else was doing. She just said, I'll just do what I can do naturally. And she served simple food. So when they first opened, what, kind of, what was the kind of food? So she, she opened a restaurant doing the food that she knew best, which was, as we know it now, country style cooking, but it was unheard of. So she would write her menus daily in English, which was a huge difference to everybody else. Um, she used what was coming in from Ballycotton Bay, from her local producers, from her own farm or her farm garden. Um, she put things like carrageen moss or rhubarb or cabbage. This just didn't happen in restaurants at that time. Um, and you know, now we know foraging as, as a, a, a very popular pastime and something that all chefs all over the world do. But she did it back in the 60s when children would come up and sell her blueberries or damsons or mushrooms that they'd picked. So then what happened after Ballymaloo was a success? And... Ballymaloo was a huge success. And because Myrtle Allen was so involved, she had written a column for years in the 60s in the Irish Firm Farmers Journal. So she was very much involved in that organisation. And they were very keen in the 80s to promote Irish food abroad in a city, somewhere international. So Myrtle Allen became um, the proprietor, or she began to run a restaurant in Paris called Le Ferme Landais. So this was in uh, the early 80s um, in Paris, right bang in the middle of saint Honoré. Um, I was lucky enough to work there for two summers. And it, she was asked to take over because the Irish Farm Association, in conjunction with FBD Insurance, had opened this restaurant, but they planted an Irish chef who was cooking French food, and so it was a disaster. 
So Myrtle took over, changed everything, made it look Irish and brought in sausages, rashers, fabulous brown bread. Did it, you see Ireland as a whole start to change in the 80s? A new confidence in Irish cooking. Yeah. Chefs knew that they could suddenly start doing what they felt was their own style of cooking. You can see that now. You know, we are now a destination, a gastronomic destination. Well, what's the legacy in the mindset of the average Irish person? Like, you know, what do they think of when they think of uh, Myrtle Allen or Ballymaloo? Following on from the cookery school, we have other businesses that have come out of the legacy of Ballymaloo. First of all, who doesn't know Ballymaloo Relish, a well, re world-renowned, uh, beautiful tomato sauce. That's run by her daughter, Yasmin Hyde. Uh, we have Cully and Scully. They're soup makers based in Cork, uh, doing very well. Alumni that came out of the cookery school would be TV personality chefs such as Clodagh McKenna. You know, they're all spreading the word of keeping the whole mission going of Myrtle Allen of good food, simple, seasonal and local. To find out more about what's going on in Dublin in the present day, I spoke to cafe owner Ray O'Neill. What was food like in Dublin when you were a kid and in the early Celtic Tiger days? Um, so food for me as a kid, I was never a, never a big foodie as a, as a kid. When I got into my 20s, I started really having an appreciation for food then, you know? Keeping things local and, and uh, you know, supporting local producers and not just kind of talking about it, but actually, you know, finding out where, 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 where the food was coming from, you know? So you... You kind of, you worked in Cake, you ended up buying Cake Cafe. That's right, yeah. Taking it over. What was, when did it open and what was going on around Dublin at the time? How did it compare? So the Cake Cafe here opened in 2006. Um, <clears throat> so when it was opened originally, um, I mean, the main focus was on like that local producers and baking everything. We've a, we have a small little kitchen in there, which we, which we do a hell of a lot in. Um, like we bake three different types of bread every morning, we bake all the cakes and, and then all the savoury food as well. F from a supplier point of view, we work heavily with Jenny McAnally. We were, I think, I think we were the first person in Dublin to start getting some of her produce off her and it's, her vegetables just don't compare to, to anything else in, in, in my opinion, you know. So, and what's their specialty? What does Jenny McAnally, who's Jenny McAnally? So Jenny McAnally, she's based out in North County, Dublin. Um, they're an organic farmer. Um, family run. Uh, I think every member of the family works works the farm. Um, so she has some amazing produce that she that uh, changes seasonally, obviously. But um, you know they they kind of branch out and, and and grow. I suppose like I mean I saw she sends us a list every week. So um, like this week there was uh, Vietnamese coriander, for example. You know. So um, so yeah. So what changes did you see with the? the crash in 2008, the economic crash and the recession that came afterwards. Yeah, I think people needed to, restaurants in particular, needed to get a lot more creative once, once the crash happened, which was a great thing. You know, pe people, uh, people started wanting, first of all, value for their money. Um, but then, you know, they, they want a good plate of food to be put in front of them, not, not just kind of, you know, thrown out in front of them and, and you know but the wine was great sort of thing you know mm. and the crack was great you know you know it was it going from maybe tea to coffee absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. um do you know in the k cafe especially there's, there's there's quite an emphasis on teas we've a quite a large tea, tea menu or whatever but yeah like that at the start of the kind of 2010s or whatever there was definitely so much more of an interest in coffee you know and people you know going the extra mile to to, to get a really good coffee and kind of pulling away from the big kind of brands that and are it kind of went hand in hand with brunch as well we all went a bit crazy for brunch well you know certain age group did Absolutely, instead of going yeah. to the pub and having a catch long up may it last coffee. it's keeping me in business so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it does definitely there's the, the brunch cook culture i mean when when i opened slice um slice is open about five years now and even the difference in that space of time has been you know phenomenal where, where i suppose going back a good few years it was if you were going out for a, a nice meal it'd be an evening time kind of affair you know whereas mm, mm. you can get that same quality during the day in, in so many places now which True. is which yeah, is great yeah. so yeah what are some of the some of the other trends that have kind of come and gone through dublin um for for better or for worse i mean i suppose about five or six years ago the whole gluten intolerant thing came in you know Whereas, you know, obviously for, for celiacs and everything else, it's, it's a, a serious disease, but we did notice that it can be kind of a trend, you know? So, 
you know, every third or fourth cake ordered would be gluten free, needs to be gluten free. Um, and then that kind of changed a couple of years back where um, uh, the vegan trend really took off. Which was which was great to see as well, you know, that people are kind of conscious as well. But um, whereas we might have done one vegan cake a week before, we probably do on orders of maybe six or seven now. So. You guys used to make donuts as well. That yeah, kinda, the donut the donut craze was a <laughs> was a big thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I started doing something called Dirty Donut Thursday, in uh, in Slice, where we'd make donuts um, in the flavor of ice cream. So obviously a lot of businesses are under pressure at the moment. We're hit with COVID. Hospitality has been hit hard. Absolutely. How are places coping in your, in, you know, in your mind or from well, what you see? I mean, from my own point of view, when COVID hit back Mar last March, I mean, nobody knew what to do. Do you know, it was just such a shock to the system. Like we've never been told to close our doors before, you know? So um, yeah, it was a big shock. So, so, uh, Initially, I closed Slice for, for two weeks and then myself and my partner came back and we just started baking and baking and baking. And so Slice has gone from being effectively, a, you know, a, a brunch, lunchtime uh, restaurants with a bit of uh, evening time as well, private bookings and that. But we had to change the whole business model and turn it now into, into a shop. So we still do all of the, the takeaway lunch items, but um, we have all of the shop items as well. Sweet. And then cake, how did cake adapt? Um, so a cake, it's a bit different. You'll see there's a, we have a big courtyard here. So a lot of people would, would come here to enjoy the courtyard in, in the summer months and that. Um, and when we could open for outdoor seating, it was, it was perfect. But um, and when we go back to takeaway, I had to kind of think of, of, of what we were going to do with the business and kind of change the business model. So what we've done, started doing, well, we've, we've, we're doing it about eight months now, is uh, afternoon, afternoon tea at home boxes. Which have, which have really taken off. So there's a selection of sandwiches, selection of cakes, um, cookies, selection of teas, and then Prosecco cocktails, which, are, which we deliver to people's homes or around Dublin. So that's, that's really kind of taken off. But definitely uh, the businesses that have kind of s uh, survived through this are the businesses that have kind of pivoted and, and, and changed the business model. That's, that's all you can do in times like this, I suppose. You know. Any other, have you seen any really creative Changes. Uh, well, I mean, I just, I just think like hats off to the, to the restaurants, especially the kind of evening time ones where, where their business has been totally decimated. Like I'm, I'm lucky in Slice where, where we've turned the cafe into a shop, but it's not an option for everybody. But some of the food boxes that are, that are out there now are just, just fantastic, you know. Um, I had one recently from, from Mamo and Hoth, which was just phenomenal, you know. Um, so yeah, people are, people are changing and people are adapting and that's kind of the only way you can do it really, you know. To learn more about food tourism, I spoke to Paul Smith, who is the founding director of a new food and drink network which has been making waves in the past year. France, Italy, California, all these places, they've been marketing themselves as food and drink tourist destinations for a long time. Is Ireland been doing that? What's okay, Ireland's Ireland has been a food destination, or a tourism destination for a long, long time. We weren't known for our food, but the last 20 or so odd years, uh, you've had food networks coming up in Cork, Boyne Valley, the Borren, uh, recently there you've Waterford and Donegal, and I, I'd be involved in the food and drink network in County Wicklow. It's called Wicklow Naturally. It's a new enough food network. How did it come about? 2019, there was a, a crowd of us came together, 18 to be exact, of some civil servants and people that worked in the industry from chefs to food producers to growers to drink producers. And a year later, we come up with a brand Wicklow Naturally, which is the umbrella that we promote all the different food and drink producers that are made in County Wicklow. And we have some excellent food producers. You have Wicklow Way Wines, which produce a, a blackberry wine. You have the Glendalough, the Distill Potchy in the old way. You have the Wicklow Wolf and the Wicklow Brewery. Then when you go down to food, you have uh, organic gardeners. You have Antarctic and Wicklow Town. You have Bailey's Farm, who produce the cream for the Bailey's drink. We have plenty of cheese makers here. Uh, Wicklow Farmhouse, Coolatin, Old MacDonald's. And you have the halloumi from the sheep farmers up in Ballyhuckert. And tell me, so this Wicklow Naturally thing, 
they've uh, come up with some signature dishes for Wicklow. What are some of them? Well, Wicklow naturally, last year was our first year really pushing it. And even during COVID, uh, we had to be very innovative in what we've done. And we got a group of chefs together to publicise and promote all the good produce and drink producers that we have in the county. So we created four signature dishes. Uh, the first one was the appetizer, which is the Wicklow Stampy, which it, it's a variation of a box tea. It's made with potatoes, sea spinach, apple and rock samphire. The main course is the Huntsman Stew, uh, Wicklow Venison, which we're renowned for, and that's paired with a blackberry wine. And then you have all the different berries that enhance that dish that grow at the same time of year as the venison season starts. The Wicklow Natural Dessert was the Glen Bermal Crumble, which is a take on a rhubarb crumble with a uh, season with gorse flowers, uh, which are synonymous with Wicklow, give a coconut and an almond flavour. There was rose hip jelly went over it. Uh, rose hips have two and a half thousand grams of vitamin C per 100 gram, as opposed to an orange, which has 53 grams per 100 gram. And then that was topped off with some of the Valley Hookbook ice cream. The cheese board was called the Ashleen, which stems from Ashleen McConglina, an old middle tale in Ireland, which was mainly a story about food uh, in a land of food. Uh, it relates to Bon Beer, which is dairy products. Uh, the cheese we had on that was your Wicklow Farmhouse nettle cheese. We had some of your blue cheese from Wicklow Farmhouse. Then you had the Colatin Aids cheddar. You had Old McDonald's goat cheese. And then you had the sheep salumi. And that was served with a, a gooseberry chutney, which known locally as goose gobs. Food tourism taken off around Ireland? Can you yeah, do tours? I mean, food tourism now, before COVID, there was people starting to arrive here. For food tourism, we've an uh, ample amount of Michelin star restaurants in Ireland. You, you, you've all levels of eating, from your street food, but the, the whole level of food on offer now ha has jumped up majorly. I spoke to Owen Coyle, owner of successful food truck operation, The Atlantic Drifters, which specializes in fresh fish for tour around Galway. What's the crack, buddy? How are you? How's it going? Long What's time no see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're looking well. well. You're looking thank well. Thank you, thank you. Likewise, likewise. likewise. Yeah. Uh, so, tour Galway. Wow, yeah. What's Delight, on the cards? To do it. Yeah. yeah, plenty on the cards, man. Yeah. This is a Nemo's, or lo as local locals call it, or beer. Uh, that was its uh, predecessor's name. Uh, Ivan McNamara has been, uh, you know, a, a heavyweight in the Galway food scene for 20 years plus. And uh, yeah, she's, she's a real kind of bastion of good food, sustainability, uh, trendy food, operates a great menu, very friendly staff. And um, yeah, it's just been a, a very solid kind of dependable place to eat for two decades now. The Spanish Arch is the last existing archway to the old medieval city walls. It was also an entryway for international trade. So Galway was, was a, a hotspot. Uh, uh, for trade between uh, Spain and Portugal and even North Africa. Um, they managed to avoid uh, kind of heavy British taxes at the time, traded directly with the Irish. Um, so you would have had a lot of wine, port, silks, spices, dried fruits, fresh fruits coming into Galway and it would have done incredible things for the diet of the gentry in the west coast. This is still referred to as the fish market and it, it is still technically a fish market but people tend to trade indoors now. So you had the fish market here and then up at St Nicholas's you would have had the vegetable and livestock market, yeah. the small crane down uh, on the west, down the west uh, would have dealt with grain and cattle as well and then up by the docks you had the Bonov market so the pig market. So, do you fancy a cup of coffee? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. These, awesome. these guys are uh, Coffee Works and Press, so uh, they put out amazing high quality coffee and they also support a lot of local uh, designers, artists, and um, they also sell some gorgeous interior design artifacts. Um, a lot of coffee shops are doing that now, yeah. Yeah. They're kind of selling bits and kind Yeah, a nice bit of duality shop. of drinking and looking. Yeah, and helping people yeah. in the community. So 
Uh, we're walking into an area now where the Galway Civic Market is held every Saturday for as long as I can remember and as long as most Galwegians can remember. Uh, it's, a really, it's a really varied affair these days now. It's, uh, whereas when I was a child, it was uh, a very traditional market. It was vegetables, dairy, poultry. You could buy live poultry or dead poultry. And that was essentially it. Now you're looking at everything from uh, local, uh, local cheeses, uh, meat producers. It's an amazing patchwork of cultures uh, and, and culinary backgrounds. It's a really fun way to spend an afternoon. Thanks yeah, it's lovely to meet up again. Tour of Galway and the food My pleasure, man. A little bit all of history. Uh, yeah, yeah. All is always a uh, pleasure to show the town off. Bounty pool. Yeah, yeah, cool. Nice one. Right, well, I'm going to head back to the East Coast. Yeah. And that concludes our tour of Irish food history. My name is Tyg Byrne, wishing you a very happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone all around the world. <laughs>